It's been two days since NASA's historic launch of the latest moon rocket launch. I can't help but shiver when I think of the scene of the red team on Zero Deck when SLS is alive, creaking, making venting noises, all due to a new leak that developed at a valve located within the base of the mobile launcher, forcing NASA to stop the flow of fuel. Such leaks were the bane of this rocket's existence during previous launch attempts. When another leak arose during this countdown, it seemed to many we'd witness yet another scrubbed launch or worse, a rollback to the vehicle assembly building for repair. Yet that's not what happened. As the spectacle in the Florida skies early on Wednesday morning, November 16th proved, as the world watched to see if this fuel leak could be repaired, Artemis One mission managers made a risky decision. They would send a red crew, a specialized team of technicians to what engineers call zero deck at the base of a fueled rocket to try and stop that liquid hydrogen leak. The work took longer than expected, but just before 11 p.m., the crew headed back out from the pad, giving a thumbs up to the cameras. And that's really, really lucky. When a rocket's filled with propellants, human beings usually aim to be as far away as possible. A rocket in the best of circumstances is a controlled chemical reaction that lifts tons of material to space on top of a tower of fire. On its worst day, it's an explosive catastrophe that incinerates anything that gets too close. But thus, it was surprising on Tuesday that during this launch countdown, real human beings headed toward the launch pad. And now SLS has launched successfully and the red team is safe. However, during remote camera pickups from Launch Complex 39B, photographers have been explicitly told in all caps to not take photos of the Artemis One launch tower. Now that's really odd. Is NASA hiding something? So what's going on? Well, let's discuss it all right now. Mobile Launcher One supports the 355-foot-tall SLS rocket, provides access to the Orion spacecraft, and provides power, communications, coolant, and fuel to the rocket. Well, it's not the first time we've talked about the NASA Mobile Launch Tower, as NASA spent a decade and about a billion dollars for a single one. The 2021 analysis found the total cost of constructing and modifying the structure known as Mobile Launcher 1 is at least $927 million. And that includes the original $234 million development cost to build the tower to support the Ares-1 rocket. After this rocket was canceled in 2010, NASA then dropped an additional $693 million to redesign and modify the structure of the SLS rocket. Notably, NASA's original estimate for modifying the launch tower was just $54 million, according to reports by Inspector General Paul Martin. But maybe that $1 billion wasn't enough, as now sources are saying that yes, Launch Complex 39B's tower was damaged during the Artemis One launch on Wednesday morning. Basically, there were leaks and damage where there weren't supposed to be leaks and damage, so NASA has been super sensitive about ITAR. Specifically in a statement from NASA, here's what was announced. Teams are still in safing operations at the pad. It remains a controlled area. At this time, only essential personnel are permitted to enter the pad perimeter. Media is expected to be able to retrieve their cameras tomorrow morning. Because of the current state of the configuration, there are ITAR restrictions and photos are not permitted at this time. There's also launch debris around the pad as anticipated and the team is currently assessing. I asked them to provide you with more info on the ITAR situation. The umbilical plates are exposed and high-res shots of those would be an ITAR violation. Referring to ITAR, that stands for International Traffic and Arms Regulation, which is a United States regulatory regime to restrict and control the export of defense and military-related technology to safeguard U.S. national security and further U.S. foreign policy objectives. Well, there is a fact that NASA's previously happily shown almost every other umbilical, including many diagrams and schematics on NTRS and elsewhere. In this case, I can only assume that TSMUs are both retracted, so the only possible thing that might be a little suspect ITAR-wise are the small ICPS umbilical plates. I'd hope it's an ITAR thing, but at that distance, I doubt it. It is completely unusual for NASA to not provide images of the mobile launch tower. Sure would be disingenuous if it was to avoid amateur assessment of damage from solid rocket exhaust. Meanwhile, SpaceX also seems to be having problems with its rocket. 
Around 10 a.m. Pacific on November 17th, SpaceX test-fired one of its Falcon 9s and announced that the next Starlink launch would follow as early as Friday, November 18th. Seven hours later, SpaceX canceled that plan, stating it needed to take a closer look at data gathered during the test. Next Space Flight reports that Falcon 9 Booster B-1061 is assigned to the launch, making it responsible for the static fire portion of Thursday's launch rehearsal. B-1061 is one of six Falcon boosters that's completed 10 launches and will become either the fourth or fifth to launch 11 times or more when it launches SpaceX's Starlink 2-4 mission. But after SpaceX's unusual post-test announcement, the rocket and its Starlink payload will have to wait indefinitely while the company determines how to proceed. It's not the first time that SpaceX has delayed a launch indefinitely after a static fire test, but it is the first time in years. SpaceX semi-regularly stands down from a launch attempt to conduct inspections or complete minor repairs or component replacements if data is amiss or contradictory. But those plans tend to mention the next launch target. This time, even SpaceX's website has been scrubbed to say a new target launch date will be announced once confirmed. The last time a pre-launch static fire was explicitly blamed for a launch delay, August 2019 when SpaceX fired up a Falcon 9 rocket ahead of its Amos 17 launch and didn't like what it saw and decided to replace a valve on the booster, and then conducted a second static fire test to clear the rocket to launch. It's possible that Starlink's 2-4 sequence of events will end up being similar. Airspace closures indicate that Starlink 2-4 had already been delayed multiple times, missing targets on November 16th and 17th to November 18th. When it does launch, Starlink 2-4 will be SpaceX's 65th operational Starlink mission and is scheduled to add another 52 Starlink V1.5 satellites to the Constellation's Group 2 shell. Group 2 is the third largest of five shells that make up SpaceX's first 4408 satellite Starlink constellation, and that will have 720 satellites once completed. SpaceX has nearly finished two main 1584 satellite shells that orbit over Earth's mid-latitudes. It also began launching one of two smaller shells, Group 3 and Group 5, that orbit Earth's poles. Group 2 splits the difference with an orbit incline 70 degrees relative to the Earth's equator. After all, once again, we see that, quote, rockets are hard, but in return, its reward is huge. And that about wraps it up for today's episode. Don't forget, share your ideas in the comment section. Your support motivates us to create more quality video. And for that, we thank you so much and hope to see you next time.